I knew that if I had gone from city to city chasing the ring, you'd be like, I could go up there and make this play, but I could be looking like Vernon Davis after <laughs> too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Boys out there hunting, man. It was a, it was a, a bunch of hungry dogs, man. And they, when they, when they smelled the blood in the air, they was coming. You know. If you don't know who this man is by now, you've been living under a rock for the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. Look, I know you probably get tired of hearing it, but I got I to gotta read down this accolade list. I got to read down it. Walter Payton Man of the Year, All-Pro, 11-time Pro Bowl. I got one. Um, NFL, two-time NFL receptions leader, 2010's All-Decade Team, 100th Anniversary all team. Let's take it to college. Uh, Blendikoff winner, All American. The list goes on and on. Larry Fitzgerald, ladies and gentlemen, brother, I appreciate you. Now I appreciate you allowing me to come on. I'm a big fan of what you guys do, and um, it's obviously great catching up with you and yeah. um, looking to chop it up about some great, great, great memories, man. No doubt. No doubt. A lot of them, a lot of them, didn't, a lot of them didn't turn out good for me, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cut right into it. I hear all those accolades, Larry. Why was you so damn good? What made you good? <laughs> uh, talk I, you your stuff. Talk your stuff, know. Larry. Talk your stuff now. No, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not really. I'm not really. You know that guy to, to toot my own horn. But you know, I was I was blessed with some great opportunities as a youngster. I, I, I was afforded the opportunity to learn from some of the greatest to ever do it. You know, from Chris Carter, Randy Moss, and Jake Reed, and some really, really great guys. I got a chance to work with them and see them up close and personal, what they were doing in terms of the footwork, you know, the, the route, you know, progression, and, you know, the way they caught the ball, laid hands, and the way they worked every single day. So I was seeing that at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, 16 years old, you know, and it started becoming ingrained in me, not only the technique and things they were doing, but also just the, the work ethic and the velocity they were doing it at. And, I started just taking what I saw every day and try to implement it into my own ability. And, you know, I grew up in Minnesota, so I didn't compete, you know, against, you know, the best of the best talent, right? It's a really small state. And I, I played two-way football. You know, my graduating class it was like 100 and, you know, small 10 kids or something like that. So, I mean, we didn't compete against great players. So I was always kind of knocked because of the, the level of competition. You know, had I been – in Texas or Florida or California or somewhere in the South Georgia where there was a lot of other really talented players that I could compete against, I think it would have been a little bit different. And so when I got to college, man, it, it really was, um, it was like baptism by fire. I remember, <laughs> I remember the first day in training camp, I called my dad. I was like, dad, I, I don't know if I'm cut out for this, you know? And my dad literally just hung up the phone on me. He's like, I ain't trying to hear that shit. Like, Get on with that. You better, I got you this far. You, you got it from here. And you know, I, it was like a couple of days to kind of get my footing. You know, I remember we had three days. The first, the first, you know, my first training camp. You know, I was training camp in high school it was so easy. I mean, I would, it was chill. And I got to college. We had practice at seven a.m. Then we had another one at eleven. Then we had another one at three. And it was physical, full pads. And you know, I just wasn't accustomed to the physicality of it. And um, it took me a few days, maybe a few weeks, to really kind of get my confidence back to where it should have been in terms of I could compete at this level, but you know, it was a rude awakening. I don't want to gloss over something, but let's go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Take it back. Wide receivers, you were Chris Carter, Randy Moss, I believe Dante Culpepper yeah. was the quarterback. During that time, I think that your father yeah. covered the team, right, at that time, and you yourself worked mm -hmm. with the team. Can you give us some stories about yeah. what it was like with Hall of Fame wide receivers, which Hall of Fame is what you're on your way to being. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Um, and we just you just mentioned like you know on the offensive side of the ball, I could go and talk about Chris Doman, who's a you know University of Pittsburgh, and you know a Hall of Famer as well, John Randall, who's also a Hall of Famer. You know, every single day watching him compete against Randall McDaniel, who's also a Hall of Famer. I mean, so like. You know, there was another guy, cornerback, that we had by the name of Dell Carter. You know, he was troubled in some of the things that had happened to him off the field. But in terms of a skill level, like, you'll never see – I mean, he was just as talented as Deion Sanders or any of these other guys in terms of his quickness and his ability to track the ball. And um, so the battles that I saw every single day, it was literally – it was iron sharpening iron every day. I mean, there was days in practice that Coach Green would have to take John Randall out, you know, a practice because they literally couldn't run any play. He was so <laughs> disruptive. Yeah. He was so disruptive that they couldn't run plays. I mean, he was in the backfield every time, and his motor, 
I just remember him every single day coming out with the same in intensity. Um, and like he was just ferocious in his mentality. You know, he was a free agent and he carried that free agent mentality with him. Everything he did. I mean, the walkthroughs full speed, you know, individual drills with full speed after practice, you know, getting extra snaps and get offs full speed. Everything he did was that way. And it forced everybody around him to get better. In the same way with Chris Carter, you know, he would, you know, Coach Green would give him a day off, and he would be watching practice and see it wasn't up to to snuff. He would see like it it, it was his lack of intensity. He would go back to the locker room, get his pads, and get the get the shit jumping, really? man. Like it was really, <laughs> about, they was really about that life, and like that's kind of what I was cut from, you know, seeing that type of, um, you know, practice habits mm -hmm. and just. You know, I remember Chris Carter getting jammed up one time. We were, they were scrimmaging. They used to do these big scrimmages back in the day, similar to how they do now, but they were professionals. They weren't fighting. They were out there getting that work in. And we would go, and they were scrimmaging against Kansas City Chiefs. That's when they had, you know, Dale Carter was there. They had James Hasty. Um, they had Derek Thomas. They had all these unbelievable players, and you get a chance to, to watch that. I was just mesmerized by, you know, the attention to detail and the level of competition. And I'm, you know, 12 and 13 years old and watching that. So I'm like, this is the standard. This is this is what it looks like. And I would imagine it was very similar with you when you got to, you know, you, you got to Seattle and you were seeing, you know, the level of competition. And then you just like, like, if I want to play, if I want to, if I want to stand out and if I want to make this a career, like, this is what it got to look like. It. And um, and so I learned that, you know, much younger than most guys got a chance to learn it at. Yeah. And Larry, let's fast forward here. Let's let's go to your NFL career. We're talking 17 years in the NFL. I don't first of all, I don't think people understand how hard it is to play that long, but to play that long for one franchise. Obviously, the own field stuff speaks for itself, but take me into like the holistic approach it takes to last with a franchise for 17 football seasons. Well, you know, it takes a lot. The player has to give some. The organization has to give some. You know, there's always going to be contract disputes and discrepancies on this and that. And, you know, I, I, after about my seventh or eighth year, you know, I realized, like, this is where I want to be. Um, you know, I have made enough money to the point where, like, that that wasn't going to be the deciding factor. And I was always – I'm always, like, really forward thinking and how I – how I kind of set my my table, and you know, I, I was thinking more of the forty year plan as a, as opposed to the four year plan. Um, you know, I knew that if I had gone from city to city chasing the ring, that in all likelihood I would never be able to have the same level of relationships and depth of quality of relationships that I would be able to Absolutely. have in the same city for that period of time. So, in terms of like industry, you know, it's if it's the restaurants, if it's construction, if it's development, if it's phil phil philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Um, like literally whatever that is, you know, I, I had access to the very best people that were doing it in the state of Arizona. I got a chance to know, you know, how things get done in terms of my relationship with John McCain um, from a political standpoint. Like, so every single facet of, of, of the state and how it was run and the business environment, like I was getting indoctrinated into all of that. And so me moving to some other city to go chase a ring, I would lose all of the momentum that I had built here. And so, like, that was really always in the back of my mind. So if I had to take a little bit less to, to stay in Arizona, like, it, it didn't – it was inconsequential to okay. me. I'm going to walk you into a, a lot of players' mentality. I'm all about winning. Yeah. I want to win ball games, and I feel like this franchise isn't winning. You play 17 years, only four playoff appearances. So you telling mm -hmm. me that during those struggles, we're not winning, we having all these losing seasons, there was not one time when you went like, hey, man, I'm, I'm trying to it's, – it's time to make a move. I need to make a move. Trade me. Let, let me let me go flourish as as an athlete. That never that never crossed your mind. Yeah, I mean, I always thought that was like a, a short sighted view on things. I'm 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 trying to win at life uh, as opposed to winning just on the football field. And you know, when you walk away from the game, you know, any buyer that's retired, you realize that you know people don't remember how many tackles or catches or yards and things that you had. Like it's it's a it's a great footnote when somebody introduces you, but. I, I go to my son's games and kids don't remember me and that's and that's and that's fine and I did it at a really high level but that's not that was never really my objective like that was not the only thing that that was that was important to me obviously you know you don't play sports with the with the thought process that winning is not important and I and I feel like and you could ask anybody that was my teammate or anybody that was around me the way I worked every day in practice how I competed in the games um, was a was a winning winning approach, you know what I mean. So my approach to it was winning, but I was always cognitive and aware of like big picture. 
for me in terms of what I wanted to do when I was 60, as opposed to just my short term goals of 25 or 26. And some people will say like that doesn't align with, you know, greatness. And I and I and I say that's 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 anybody's personal opinion. Well, take us into a Saturday night right before you getting ready to play against the Seattle Seahawks defense <laughs> back in 2013. How good were they? And yeah. are they the best defense that you have ever faced in your career? Yeah, a lot, those those nights didn't get a lot of sleep. Um and it was it was one man in particular that that you know kept you up. You know, he was like he was like uh the candy man. Let me take a wild um, guess. Let me Boogie Let man. me take a wild guess. And and and, and, he, and, he, and he was a real dark skinned dude, <laughs> real I mean, real dark. Couldn't see his eyes. He had this big visor. And he used to always like punch his hand like this all the time, you know, whenever he would make this play. And he was he was real weird dude, man, you know, but he was he, he kept a lot of cash yeah. up at night. Cam was uh, he was that Cam dude. was he was a real he was a real issue, man. A real <laughs> issue. I never forget uh, 2015. We played up there, and uh, like we we were able to get out of there with a win, with a win. Luckily, Something like football. and I was like, man, I felt, I felt like I felt like I played solid against him. I felt like I did a good job blocking him up. And I looked at the stat sheet. I was in the, I was sitting in the locker looking at the stat. Oh boy, had 18 <laughs> tackles. <man. I'm> like, <laughs> Hey, there was a play. Uh, our our guard, Michael Potty, I never forget. He pulled it, and he was coming to spill to spill Cam, and Cam leaned on him, broke his face mask, put him in a put him in a stretcher. I'm just like, man. This... And the next day in the training room, they had his face mask because they you know they took his face mask off, you know, to, to put it to put it to put the to secure his neck. And Cam literally bent his face mask. So I sent a picture. I sent a, I sent a picture to Cam. I was like, Cam, you you a you a dirty dude, bro. Like that. you did this to a three hundred pound man. <laughs> and uh, you know, but I will say I was always I was always kind with Cam, and, <laughs> and it saved me a couple of times. There was a couple of high balls, and he'd be like, Fitz, if that was somebody I ain't know, I would have rearranged the whole setup, man. But I, I'm gonna I'm let that one slide. I was like, Cam, I appreciate you, my guy. I appreciate that. But wait, wait, Fitz. <laughs> I mean, you would, what, you one of the greatest to ever do it. Are you are you being truthful? Are you telling me that you really used to think about playing against Cam Chancellor? Seriously? Yeah, he, he make he he would make you make some business decisions out there. He would make you make some business decisions. You you'd be like, I could go up there and make this play, but I could look I could, I could be looking like Vernon Davis after <laughs> too. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, those are, like I really like my career, and I want to play. I want to continue to play. And he could end it real quick, and um, you know, so yeah, he he would have you thinking like you you were running across there, and it was zone, and your ass ain't hook it up in zone. You you gonna pay the ultimate price, you know? And it wasn't just him; it was KJ, it was <laughs> it was Bob, it was Cl it was Cliff, it was Bruce. I mean, I could name a bunch of them. The boys out there hunting, man. It was a it was a, a bunch of hungry dogs, man. And they, when they when they smelled the blood in the air, they was coming, you know. And then you got crazy, you got crazy. You got a crazy girl in the back. You don't know what he doing, man. Earl just, you got Brandon, Brandon Browner. He, hey, Brandon would, hey, he'll kill you, literally. <laughs> he will get after you, man. G, but, G. Uh, so them boys, them boys, they, they boys hungry out there. It all makes sense now. In between every time out, after the quarter, a break, who you think on the outside of the football? Hey, man, how you doing, man? How, how the family doing? Are you good? Hey, hey we're going to take care of each other, right? This dude right here, every, every so, break, he on our side talking to us. So, so Fitz, I was the car wash guy for years, okay? That's what I did. So whenever they would talk about different players, whenever they talked about you, Sherm, all of them, they always talked about how nice you were on the field, how pleasant you were, asking about their families. They used to tell me that was your strategy, to just be nice to them. Nah, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a strategy. I'm. I'm a. I'm a pretty kind guy. You know, I, I have a job to do. Obviously, and it's a, and it's a physical sport. But you know, it, like there's a lot of different ways to go about your business. And I, I was effective in doing what I needed to do. Like I never had a coach come up to me and be like, "Fitz, like stop talking. You know, stop. You know, stop doing that because you can't do your job." Now, if that if it would have been a problem and I wasn't getting my job done, I wasn't executing my assignments the way I was coached to, then that would that would be an issue. But that never that never ever. You know, became an issue. Okay, all right, Fizz. Let's get to these current NFL receivers. You got the Jamar Chases of the world, Justin Jeffersons, Devonte Adams, Jamar Chase screaming. I'm always open. Are these are are these dudes always open? I, I mean, I looked. I you know, I remember watching um, you know him early, and I've watched him over the last two years. And you you turn the tape on, my homeboy is open a yeah. lot. He's open a lot. Obviously. 
you can't get the ball every single time you're open. But he's, I mean, he wasn't lying when he said he's he's open all the time. And he, he's, I mean, he, he's getting a lot of exotic coverage and looks, and he's still finding a way to create separation. So, mm-hmm. yes, he's he's open quite often. So let me ask you this. What does that do for a quarterback when he's like, I got this receiver that's in high demand. He, he wants the ball. What does that do to a quarterback's mental? Like, does he feel like he got to force feed a guy or can he take care of the offense? Like, what does that do for him at the quarterback's position? Well, you know, I, I think a, co- a quarterback automatically knows who he wants to get the ball to. He knows who his playmakers are. And, you know, most plays when he steps back and he sees his number one receiver, he's trying to get him the football. But I think the great ones understand that if, if the defense is doing a good job of taking a guy away, we need to find creative solutions to, you know, move him in motion, um, put him inside, you know, c- create opportunities for him different ways. But if he's being double still, we other guys have to win their one-on-one matchups. And um, I think there's a really – there's a really fine line between forcing it and, you know, giving guys opportunities, you know, on 50-50 balls and one-on-one, like I'm good with that. But when the guy's being bracketed on third and four, for you to fit those balls in there, you got to be able to go somewhere else with it. Okay, so let me ask you this. At what point does, you hear the terminology, oh, he's a diva, he's a diva. He's like, what point does that receiver cross that line to where he gets labeled as that diva that nobody wants to have on their football team? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm a little different in how I assess it, right? Um, you know, if a guy's producing, you know, my tolerance is really high, though. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you know, I know, like, it's a it's a P versus T, right? Performance is high, the tolerance is high. When the top, when the performance drops, then the tolerance drops. And if you're producing for me at a really high level, um, because this is a, this is, KJ, look, you know, this is a results-driven business, bro. You either winning and you're having success or you're losing and your coaches are getting fired and players are getting cut. Like, so you have to find that happy meaning. Do you want guys to be upstanding citizens and do great things in the community and, and be great players? Absolutely. That That's the perfect, that's, those are the unicorns that you want to have. But like, that's not, that's not everybody. And, you know, there's times there's going to be guys who, you know, straddle that line. Um, but I think it's important that when you have guys like that, they sh- they can't be your yeah. leaders in the locker right. room. They have to be complementary to what's going on, and then you can control them. And then also, it, it depends on what locker room they're in. You know, I I look at you guys as locker room, and you know you have some you have some characters on that team. You know, um, guys who if they were by themselves, would probably be considered a, a distraction, right? And but. In an environment like that, where you're around other high-functioning alpha males winning, everybody understand. Yes, you can be whoever you want to be, long as it's in the confines and constraints of, of, of us moving towards that common objective. So it really just depends on it. Um, you know, I I came from a different era, man. I, I, I saw real diva activity, man. This this stuff is kind of it's like TikTokish dancing type stuff. You know, I I saw some. <laughs> Some wild stuff, man. Yeah. <laughs> can you, Fitz, can you share some strategies and or techniques? Because I would assume that there will be some young receivers or just people that play the game that are watching this right now. Some techniques and or strategies that helped you stay sharp during a season. I'm not talking about your 17-year career. What is something that you can give out there that helped you stay sharp during an NFL season? Well, I, I never really got caught up in the day to day, right? I, I just I understood that the season was a marathon, and there was going to be some good days, there were going to be bad days, there were going to be good practices, there were going to be great practices, but never be able to get yourself too high and low. And I think a lot of the like my son's 15, he's a sophomore wide receiver, and we'll have you know two good days of workouts, and he'll he'll think he's ready for the next thing. I said, no, 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 that's that's not how it works. It's just being very consistent with the same technique over a long period of time. Um, and the thing that's so difficult about football, it's not like baseball where you play 162 game schedule and you get four or five at bats every single day. That's not how it works in football. You could, you could go, you know, a long period of time without, you know, getting single coverage in the fade route that you've been working on. Like you might not, they might line up outside of you play cover one and you might not be able to get outside release. Right. You, so you never know when your opportunity is going to come. And so I'm always trying to talk to him about the sharpness and the int- intentionality about the way you go about your business. And I was, I felt like I was really good at that. Um, I was always ready for the moment. If that makes sense. I, you know, I, I never knew when the moment was re- was coming, but I always felt like I was prepared for the moment when it was there. You know, I got that look that I really was looking for. We, you know, we calling, 
you know, seams and I get I get cover two um, and, and I know I, I'm the bender, you know, because the Tampa two mic is looking strong side. Like I know this is the look. I know the technique. I got to make sure I squeeze the nickel back and make sure I keep inside leverage on the safety and I break it and I keep it high. That's keep me away from that backside safety if it's too low. You know, so like I, I'm understanding what I'm doing. I get the look that I want. I don't rush it. You know, I, I'm patient. I understand that this is not going to happen that quickly. It's got to got to let it unfold, you know. So I feel like I was always ready for the moment whenever it presented itself. And, and Larry, when you look at the Seahawks receivers, one of my favorite people on mm -hmm. this planet is Tyler Lockett. And um, they got yeah. another bad man on the opposite side in DK Metcalf. When I look at you two, DK and, uh, and, and Larry, like really similar stature, solid hands, you know, speed. What's something that you see in DK now? And what's something that he could add to his game to really make sure he has a long, successful NFL career? Well, I, I think DJ has gotten so much better, you know, even just from a few years ago. He catches the ball much more consistent. Um, you know, I remember... You know, early on, he he would struggle with some with some drops, like easy drops. I think I think he's done a a really good job of that. He's turned into a really efficient route runner. I mean, when he first got in, he was a a straight line guy, more of a slant guy. Now he's he's developed it. He can run outbreaking routes. He can run in breaking routes. He can catch balls. Um, you know, up the seam. I mean, he's done a really good job of expanding what he's been able to do. And Sanjay, I think, is, you know, one of the best wide receiver coaches in all the National Football League. This dude is one of the best technicians and, and, and route route technician developers in, in the game. And so I think that, um, you know, it's really been good for him to be able to have a coach like that, that you can work on those nuances. But, you know, he's a, he's a special talent. You know, you're not going to be around too many six foot four guys who, you know, are 10, 10, three, 10, four guys who can flat out run, but now develop into a route running uh, player who can beat you in a, in, a, in a lot of different ways. And the, and the one thing I always really stood out to me about DK also is how willing of a participant he is in the run game. You know, I was asked to do a lot of blocking in my career. So I really get excited when I see guys answer the bell in the run game, because it's easy to run routes and just, you know, run high and low based on what you're doing in your productivity. But when you are actually engaged in the development, you know, of Kenneth Walker and making sure that you are you are getting in there blocking the force and you understand, like, this is the reason we're going to get this game going. And if we can make them get out of that that too high shell, I'm going to get much more one on one opportunities. And so it, it, it does help you if you do participate in the run game. And I, and I like to see that. And I watched you go from the outside to that slot position. Is that two different worlds? Was that, is it, should DK really look to do that as he get to year nine, year 10? Like, what do you see with that? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a big adjustment. The game inside is a lot faster. I mean, there's things coming and, and, hap and happening. You know, you got to really understand the fronts. You got to understand, um, you know, the packages from dime, the base to nickels, um, the exotic, you know the guys who are really good edge edge rushers, and you know being able to recognize when you're hot and when you're when you're when you're when you have sights, and like it's it's a much faster game, but it made me a lot better player. I, mm -hmm. I got way smarter because, like, I, I looked at it initially as like as a demotion, and I took it the wrong way. But you know, if anything, it was a promotion because right. I could still play outside. But I didn't really have the nuances and the ability to play inside when I first moved in there, mm -hmm. and then after a year or two. Mm -hmm. I still had the same skill set to go play outside, but I, now I just added something to my bag. And um, and so I became a better player. I became um, more difficult to guard because now I could do this and I could do that. You know, so I think it just helped me develop into, you know, a, a better, more efficient player. Right now, Mount Rushmore, you got You can't keep your name out of it. You, your name, you cannot include it because I'm putting you at the top wide receivers of all time. But take your name out of it. Give us four top receivers of all time. What you got for us? I know I got, I got to make it tough for you, Fitz. I got to make it tough. And when we talk about Mount Rushmore, we talking off the field, on the Man, field. This is this is, this is this is this is an impossible conversation. Um, is this is this some LeBron you know, MJ type stuff? Yeah, you know, I mean because you know I'm I'm a football historian, right? So I, I've been watching football since I was born, and my dad would bring these these books home, you know these 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 uh, media guides, and I would read that thing cover to cover. So I, I could take you all the way back, Don Hudson and Paul Warfield, and every single generation, you know the game continues to evolve, you know. So you you can't compare a Justin Jefferson, um, you know, to a to a Sterling Sharp, you know, one of my favorite receivers mm -hmm. for the Green Bay Packers. You can't compare, you know. Um, you know, Stefan Diggs to, you know, Bob Hayes, right? Like the game was a very different game. And, 
you know, I think we live in a generation where like it's in front of us now, so it's got to be the best, right? And I don't necessarily describe subscribe to that. Um, and you know, he you might get no answer. Just, you might get no answer. That's, that's fine. <laughs> but, you know, but you know what though? Since you since you yeah. said that, I think I, I will go. I will go with this. I think Jerry Rice is is the best player to ever put on cleats. And why is that? I mean, he was the he was the per, he was the perfectly designed player. Mm. I mean, he ha- he literally had zero weaknesses in his game, zero. And then you then you add you know the ability to be able to play with two back to back Hall of Famers. The guy was, and he was healthy. Um, he played in a perfect you know he played in San Francisco. He played in San Francisco. It never rains. It's never cold. Um, the field is always great. Like you know, there was so many things that you, he checked every single box that you could check. He played for a Hall of Fame coach and and Coach Walsh. I mean, so like everything lined up perfectly along with him being one of the most dynamic athletes to ever do it. And I mean, I, I, it would be hard to, you know, unseat him and what he's been able to accomplish over the, over, you know, his, his career. You know what I hear from you? I hear you talked about being a historian. And when you talk about it, you just say all these names, how much did being a historian of the game make you good at this game? I think it played a huge factor in it, you know, because I was always studying and mm-hmm. I knew that I could learn something from everybody, you know, and, um, and I, you know, I, I think I, like I, I'm, I harp on my son about that, you know, um, I'm like, you need to watch, you need to, you know, watch this player. You need to watch this player. Like, dad, why are we, why are we watching Terrell Owens? He hasn't played since 2007. I'm like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, you don't think you can learn just because he didn't play? He hasn't played in the last, you know, ten plus years. Is that that the only reason you think he can't he can't help you get better? And um, you know, they think they can only learn from the players that are playing. And I never, I never subscribe to that. I always feel like I can learn from from anybody. And that goes from you know, like not only just sports, but it it goes from you know everything that I do in my life. You know, I learn I learn from people all the time that I never you know suspected I would you know, learn from. And that's just because I'm open-minded to it. Yeah. And Larry, before we let you go, man, the Arizona Cardinals, 2023 Arizona Cardinals, clearly a rebuild year. You know, what's, um? first of all, are you involved in helping them get this thing turned around? But what's something they got to do with this franchise to start becoming competitive again? Well, I think Monty, who is the GM um, now of the team, has done a really good job of this year's draft. I mean, it's got some really promising talent. Um, and yeah, they've only won one game this year, but they compete, man. They they fight. They 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 don't lay down. Um, you know, every single week, you you can say, you know, yes, they haven't won the game, but they they, they are fighting. They're going toe to toe with some of the best play uh, best teams in the game. But I like the nucleus of young players he's developing. I mean, we're gonna have two. You know, if the season continues to go as it is. You know, we'll have a top five pick, you know, with, with the Cardinals. And depending on what the Houston Texans do, we'll have another, you know, high draft pick. You know, we, we own their first round pick. And we also have a couple, you know, uh, thirds and I think two fifths or something. like I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know we have about 10, 11 picks this year um, and uh, some cap space coming up. You know, so I, I think there will be some ability for us to do some damage in free agency and also really stockpile some young talent. You know, I, I think we're in that that phase where, you know, we're not going to be competitive this year. But, um, you know, building building for the future is, is important. Yeah. And yeah. Well, I, I just want to, you know, I want to I said something to you. I said that you're one of my favorite of all time. But I want to give you another reason as to why you're one of my favorites. Um, not only were you a great football player, and a lot of people say nice things about you, but I had a, a real opportunity to experience this. And I, my son, you reached out to him when his mother passed away. G. Scott Jr., tight end for Ohio State. And I just want to tell you, man, you doing that and, and taking the time to call and talk to my son, like these are things, like that's real to me. Like this isn't a story I heard about. This is a story that I experienced. So, man, I'm I'm, I'm grateful for you to take the time to call my son, brother. Well, yeah. Well, well absolutely. I, I don't want to. I don't want to take credit. You know, Sherm actually reached out to me and asked me. He was like, he was like, Fitz, hey, I know, I know this. I've known this uh, this, this family for a very long time up in Seattle, um, and unfortunately, his mother, you know, lost her battle, similar to what what happened to your mom. I, I know it would mean a lot to him. So. You know, I appreciate Sherm, you know, keeping me in the loop as well. You know, I, I think that's important that, um, you know, when we have a, a position that you know, we can positively influence people in life, I think I think it's a responsibility that we all share and we must do it. And, you know, seeing your son up there now still shining and 
being undefeated and, you know, having a chance to compete for a natty this year, mm-hmm. you know, it, it makes me happy. I'm always pulling for him, too. Yeah, so um, he's always in my thoughts. Yeah. All right, Larry, last question, man, before we let you go. Seven year, 17 year career, you could choose one play. They're going to show one play to describe what Larry Fitzgerald stands for, what he represents. What's one play you want everybody to know? Oh, I did this. One play. It was a play that, you know, brings me a lot of pain, um, to be to be quite honest with you. But it was in the Super Bowl uh, that I played against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And you know, James Harrison got a pick against us and ran it all the way back. But um, I remember chasing him all the way down to try to get him on the ground. And you know, I, I, I like this to be thought of as somebody who never, never laid it down, no matter what the circumstances were. I'm going to fight to the end. And even when things are bleak and things are going haywire, you know, mm-hmm. somebody that would consistently give great effort. And um, that, that's 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 kind of like how I want to be thought of. Absolutely. Well, man, I truly appreciate you, bro. It's always a Absolutely. pleasure. Whenever I'm in your presence, in your in your circle, man, it's, it's always a joy of mine. So thank you, brother, for joining us. Nah, was, and, uh, I had a good time with I had a good yeah. time with you and wifey at the concert, um, the Kendrick Lamar <laughs> yeah. concert last year. That was that was a good time. Was a good, it, was, good time. it was great. It was great seeing you and catching up with you always, brother. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Congratulations on on what you guys are doing. And G, it's good to see you again as well, my brother. Yes, yeah. sir. Appreciate it. Right, Till next time, brother. All right. All right. Y'all have a good, y'all have a good day. You too, brother. You too, man. All right.